we're very pleased to add this panel and this panel construct to West 2017. And if you like it, it was our idea. If you don't, it was Nora Tyson's idea <laughs> to have this panel. But actually, Nora, I think it was a good idea. Um, we'd also like to thank, uh, thank Joey Coyne, who I think uh, Admiral Coyne came the furthest, although he says he was in Rhode Island anyway. It was just in the neighborhood. We appreciate the fact that some people traveled very far to join us today, all our panelists. My job is to introduce Vice Admiral Jamie Fogo as moderator, who will then introduce each of our panelists. But Admiral Fogo is an 81 grad of the Naval Academy, a career submariner, commanded the attack submarine Oklahoma City and the submarine squadron six. In Naples, he served as commander submarine group eight, commander allied submarine forces south, Deputy Commander, Sixth Fleet, and Director of Operations and Intelligence, the N3 for Naval Forces Europe, Africa. During that period, he served as Operations Officer, J3, for the Joint Task Force Odyssey Dawn, and additionally, he was the Task Force Commander and Joint Task Force Unified Protector in Libya. In his most recent assignment, he commanded the Sixth Fleet, Naval yeah. Striking and Support Forces yeah. NATO, Deputy Commander, U.S. Naval Forces Europe, Deputy Commander, U.S. Naval Forces Africa, and Joint Force Maritime Component Commander, Europe. Ashore, he served in a variety of positions and assignments, including Executive Assistant to Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Admiral Mike Mullen, Executive Officer to Admiral Jim Stavridis as Supreme Allied Commander, Europe, and Commander, United States European Command. He directed the assessment division in OPNAV, the CNO staff, yeah, sure. N81, and served as assistant chief of naval operations, operations plans, strategy, N3, N5B. In June 2016 proceedings, he co-authored an article with Alaric Fritz, The Fourth Battle of the Atlantic. That article was a seminal piece that had worldwide reach. Admiral Fogo assumed duties as director Navy staff in November 2016. Let's give a warm welcome to Vice Admiral Jamie Fogel. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, sounds like from the echo you can all hear me. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to just say thank you to Vice Admiral Pete Daly and the professionals from the Naval Institute and also our counterparts from AFSEA, General Shea, uh, for putting this uh, wonderful forum together. Pete joked with me as I got up on the podium here. He goes, hey, I just want to let you know I changed the subject from, uh, you know, can we fight to uh, uh, China. And it was a throwback to four years ago when we did this uh, very similar panel in this same room uh, with people like Jim Finnell up on the stage who were right in the uh, pointy end of the spear. Uh, and so today we bring war fighters from all over the world, from all over uh, the numbered fleets to talk to you. And uh, our panel discussion today is are we ready to fight? now and in the future. So I'm delighted to be here in my role as the Director of Navy Staff. It gets me out of the Pentagon for a day and a half, sunny San Diego. We've only got an hour and 15 minutes, so I'm mindful of our time and your time, and we want to make sure we have time for questions and let the fleet commanders engage. Um, as noted by Pete, I just completed my uh, tour as Sixth Fleet Commander in Europe last October, and unfortunately, Vice Admiral Chris Grady, my relief, couldn't be here today. So I'm going to stump a little bit for him in the beginning, and then. Uh, I'll introduce my fellow uh, fleet commanders to my left, and then we'll get going with each of their individual presentations. Um, so first of all, let me introduce Vice Admiral Joey O'Coin, who's joining us from uh, Yakuska, Japan, uh, as the commander of 7th Fleet. Prior to taking command, Admiral O'Coin served as the N9 on the OPNAV staff. He was N80 before that. He was a great friend to me when I was across the hall at N81. Nobody knows any more about budget and war fighting and capability than Joey. He led the uh, John C. Stennis Strike Group and was commander of Air Wing 5 in uh, Japan as well, so tremendous experience. Uh, to his left, our cyber guy, Vice Admiral Mike Gilday, made the trip with me from Washington, D.C. to be here with you today as commander of 10th Fleet, which is doing a phenomenal job protecting our networks and making sure that uh, the adversaries know that they need to be on guard. Mike has significant and allied experience as the Chief of Staff for Naval Striking and Support Forces NATO, uh, a place out in Lisbon that's uh, near and dear to both of our hearts. We had served together out there, and the Ops Officer for NATO's Joint Force Command. He also commanded the Dwight D. Eisenhower Strike Group. 
He was my relief when I was executive assistant uh, to Admiral Mike Mullen on the Joint Staff. To his left, Vice Admiral Nora Tyson. She had to travel the least distance, but had the most problem with traffic to get here as Commander of Third Fleet from San Diego. Nora recently served as Deputy Commander U.S. Fleet Forces Command, did a wonderful job down there uh, under Admiral Gortney and uh, then Admiral Davidson, and was a former Executive Assistant to the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Mike Mullen. She was the uh, first strike group commander to deploy on uh, George H.W. Bush, uh, the first woman to be a strike group commander. I know she doesn't like us when we single that out, but it was a significant achievement. I was in Europe when she came, and it was uh, an incredible experience for us and the Europeans to have Nora in the theater with the Bush. To her left, Rear Admiral Sean Buck left one tropical locale for another from Mayport, Florida, to come here to San Diego. Sean really le recently left the Pentagon as the uh, Joint Staff J-5 Chief of Staff, and that prepared him well for his current tour as the Commander of Fourth Fleet. Uh, he's taken on the bad guys down in the Caribbean, doing a lot of counter-drug operations, with, and uh, Jayat of South is in his, uh, his AOR, and he partners with the interagency and the Coast Guard there, and just doing a wonderful job. He left some great stories for us today. Uh, we couldn't do this without our brethren in the Coast Guard. Vice Admiral Fred Midget is commander of U.S. Coast Guard Area Pacific and has made the trip from Alameda, California to be with us here today. Fred's responsible for all U.S. Coast Guard missions halfway around the world, from the Rocky Mountains to the east coast of Africa. Immediately prior to this tour, he was the Deputy Commandant for Operations responsible for operational strategy, policy, and guidance for the entire Coast Guard. I don't know how, would he, how somebody gets a great career path in the Coast Guard like that, but we're lucky to have him with us today. So let me kick it off with a brief primer on Europe, and then we'll go to Joey for the Pacific. Um, while all these unparalleled sea service professionals here today will be able to offer you some insight as to whether or not uh, we are ready to fight, and I think the uh, hands-down answer is yes, I'll give you uh, a little bit of what's going on in the European theater. I don't want to steal uh, any of the thunder from Admiral Phil Davidson, Commander U.S. Fleet Forces Command and author of the new distributed maritime operations strategy that we are embracing in the Navy, but it's my intent for the panel to illustrate how fleet commanders attempt to execute this vision constant, constantly and in a constantly changing environment and a somewhat constrained uh, operating area. Uh, during my time as Sixth Fleet Commander, I encountered numerous challenges, and I'm going to borrow a play from the Supreme Allied Commander and Commander UCOM's playbook, uh, General Curtis Scaparotti, many of you know him, when he categorized these challenges into three primary bins. He called them the three R's, the Russians, the Radicals, the Refugees, for us folks in Europe. And uh, I've spoken at, at length about them, I've written about them, but in the vein of today's discussion, are we ready to fight? First of all, I'd like to say we are, but only if we have to. And operating in the Mediterranean and throughout the Atlantic, we're required to maintain constant vigilance on Russian forces and some of these other challenges, which necessitated a very highly trained and ready force. This was demonstrated by my first photo, Mike. You've seen that before. That was the uh, shot seen around the world, the money shot of the Su-24 aircraft in the Baltic Sea about 30 feet from wingtip to the deck of the USS Donald Cook at 500 knots. That was one of many sorties that came over the ship that day. And if you ask me the question, was the commanding officer prepared to defend his ship, I'll deflect that question to Commander Chuck Hampton, who is in the audience here today, Captain Chuck Hampton, who is a special assistant to fleet forces. He was the commanding officer of the ship, and he can answer that question for you. Uh, now, you can see from that picture that that thing in the middle of the fuselage is not a bomb, it's a fuel tank. We watch these guys when they take off and they come at us, and so we exercise the proper restraint as Chuck did on that particular day. You also note that Admiral Stavridis in his keynote this morning, just coming out of Munich, he talked about these kind of threats and challenges out there and how dangerous they are when you don't exactly know the intentions of somebody flying at 500 knots who intends to come as close as 30 feet from your warship. And the worst case scenario would be that he clipped that ship and went in the water, and then we would be accused of having shot it down. Uh, there are other challenges and stressors out there in terms of the radicals and violent extremist organizations. We had our fill of them while we were there, and we exercised uh, even before the, the paper uh, was instantiated. 
distributed maritime operations uh, in North Africa, and particularly in the Gulf of Sidra, and in particularly in the city of Sirte, uh, where there was formerly a large contingent of ISIS present and no longer, no longer exists. Slide. The USS WASP Amphibious Readiness Group, and that's some of the Marines uh, from on board the WASP, deployed from Norfolk and was bound for the AOR without really, I mean, they had trained, and they had trained to certain uh, capabilities and warfighting uh, specialties we all do. They're all certified. No particular idea they would be involved uh, off the coast of Libya and North Africa in kinetic strike operations against ISIS. Phase two, and isn't it amazing? You know, we talk about dealing with the Russians in a phase one or phase zero environment, and here we are in phase two in the same theater not far away. Uh, so the, the lines are somewhat blurred, and we've got to be ready to fight all the time. It wasn't just uh, the WASP, and uh, WASP was there with a the three-ship ARG, and as part of the, uh, the Marine Corps' view of distributed maritime operations, we uh, we split that ARG and MU and allowed two of the units to go into the Arabian Gulf and fight from there. WASP did this by herself with support from uh, our DDGs from Rota. Again, distributed maritime operations. Slide. Uh, this is a picture of USS Kearney uh, keeping the enemy awake at night. Insert. We didn't give them uh, any downtime. Uh, the lights were on 24-7 so we could see them and find them and eliminate them in the dark. And those are illumination shells that had not been fired since the Gulf of Tonkin uh, in the Vietnam War. About 300 of them fired in support of kinetic operations off WASP. Uh, so let me stop there and say, are we ready to fight? You bet we are. Uh, that was my particular area of operations. I'll turn over to Admiral O'Coyne and ask him to articulate some of the things that he is doing out in the Pacific. Joey, over to you. All right, uh, just to give you a heads up, all of us have been to the Jamie Fogo School of Speaking, which is to keep talking and talking so there's no time at the end to answer any questions. Right. So <laughs> we're going to have some pretty long answers. But uh, really, if, if you ask Seventh Fleet if we're ready, unequivocally, uh, we're prepared uh, to fight if, uh, if necessary. You know, uh, there are many segments of our Navy that are being uh, reduced or uh, due to constrained resources. Uh, but fortunately, out in Seventh Fleet, uh, we're uh, doing very well. We're very well resourced and very well manned. Uh, and so uh, we got a lot going for us out there. The, um, and then if you ask our people, um, you know, the importance of being ready, they understand uh, that we have to be ready to uh, fight at a moment's notice. And so I feel very uh, fortunate, and we are, you know, if necessary, we're ready to um, uh, deliver decisive combat power uh, on, above, and below the surface uh, if necessary. The, um, you know, as far as... Uh, Talking about the threats out there, I don't want to, um, you know, uh, narrow it down to say perhaps China, but really to talk about uh, overall uh, the threats uh, in the Indo-Asia Pacific, and they really are, uh, you know, challenges of regional stability, um, the uh, challenges to uh, continuing prosperity, um, and um, uh, challenges to rules and norms. And when I talk to my counterparts out there, uh, fleet commanders, you really can lump uh, those uh, threats into five uh, categories, uh, starting with uh, natural and man-made disasters, um, terrorism and uh, WMD uh, proliferation, illegal and unregulated uh, fishing, uh, uh, human and uh, drug trafficking, and uh, environmental uh, danger to the environment, uh, like uh, the ongoing uh, land reclamation down in the South China Sea. So, um, when you look at those threats, uh, you know the U.S. Navy uh, uh, has a spectrum of capabilities uh, that really lends itself uh, in that in those threats that I mentioned. And so, in the, in the Indo-Asia Pacific, uh, Seven Fleet uh, is oftentimes the partner of choice, just because of the capabilities, the robust and enduring capabilities that we bring to the region. The um, as far as uh, Key components of our uh, of our readiness. Uh, a big one is our network of relationships that we have uh, in the Indo Asia Pacific, that um, uh, really uh, enables us, uh, along with our partners and allies, to maintain the regional stability and the security in, in the region. And uh, that didn't just happen overnight. We've been working on that for a long time. 
just over the last year, we've done over 100 exercises uh, with our partners and allies, and that keeps us very busy. And the purpose of the exercises is to uh, enhance our uh, uh, capabilities, warfighting capabilities, uh, to exchange information, and to train together uh, so that we know one another, we develop relationships, and um, that will make it easier uh, when uh, crisis arises. The, uh, we have a number of exercises, big ones like King Sword, uh, Ulchi Freedom Guardian, uh, the, uh, our Carrot Series, a cooperative afloat uh, readiness and training, uh, which I think we're up to nine now uh, with, the, um, uh, with many of the countries in Southeast Asia, uh, which really enables us to enhance our operability, our communications, and develop those relationships uh, with other navies uh, so they're ready, uh, we're ready when the need arises. The exercises range uh, a whole slew from, um, uh, from the high end with uh, our closest allies to advanced uh, anti-submarine warfare, anti-surface warfare, air-to-air, -air, and then on the other side of the spectrum to uh, fundamental uh, seamanship and, uh, and navigational training uh, with some of the up-and-coming navies in, uh, in the Indo-Asia Pacific. And so that helps us uh, uh, really get to know the area, and, and so to speak, uh, know the terrain, uh, so that uh, we're very well versed in the Indo-Asia Pacific, uh, and, uh, and we also know uh, a lot about the navies that sail those waters. So in the long run, the exercises help us a lot. The, uh, another factor in maintaining our readiness is uh, uh, the Blue Ridge, uh, my flagship, the good ship uh, Blue Ridge. Uh, which uh, just uh, the last patrol, we patrolled over 13,000 miles and went to 10 different ports and uh, really strengthened our relationships uh, with, our, uh, with our allies, uh, with staff talks, with uh, receptions, with uh, community relations and so forth. Uh, that um, uh, even doing a, a, like a confidence um, um, uh, building exercise with a uh, Chinese destroyer. Um, and, uh, and so the, the Blue Ridge also helped us as far as um, uh, maintaining those relationships with those 36 countries uh, that, um, uh, for the most part, we are improving our relationships, all but one. Uh, are you going to ask a question on this, or is this pretty much just free speech? Uh? Free speech, we'll, what we'll do is we'll go through all the fleet commanders, and then we'll come back to uh, questions. Okay. 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 So I'm not, uh, I'm sorry. So I'm already answering the question. Yeah, no, that's good. You're okay. good. It's good. Okay. Uh, but uh, so I'll, I'll curtail and, uh, and uh, wait for the, uh, the question to come later then. Uh, but uh, it's great to be here. And, uh, and so you already have half the answer uh, to the first question that's going to come up here in the second. Uh, but I will uh, turn the floor over to my good uh, friend, 10th Fleet. First question is, how did you get the question? <laughs> I'm the cyber guy. I don't have the question. <laughs> All right. Mike, you're doing something wrong. So uh, to answer the, uh, the question up front, are we ready to fight tonight? I think, I think the real answer is it depends. And um, give that a little bit of context, I need to talk about the threat. Uh, and so the threats that we face in cyberspace have no home port. They have no geographic boundaries. They operate in a domain that is global. Uh, they hide in places like coffee shops in Portugal, uh, libraries in Uganda. Uh, and their attack vectors are often difficult to pick up. Um, they uh, tend to obscure in the tra within the rest of the traffic of cyberspace with some four billion users on, uh, online at any given time. It's a difficult problem sometimes to uh, sort the mix, as they say, in the aviation world. Some of the trends that we see right now, uh, a rapid increase in the number of cyber actors, and this has been going on for some time a rapid rise, uh, rapid increase in capabilities, both the stealth and the lethality of malware. And it's cheaply available or available for free uh, and is produced at a rate of a uh, new piece of malware every some three or four seconds. We see a higher degree of automation, particularly from proxies that, accurate, that operate on behalf of nation states and their ability to spray and pray uh, malware not only at dot .mil target space, but also dot .com. We also see uh, reverse engineering going on all the time. So a good 
example of that is encryption, which was intended uh, to help us uh, keep our communications private and keep our data secure. Well, ransomware has flipped that and used encryption in ways that we initially didn't think possible to hold our, to hold our systems at risk. What underpins all the trends that I just spoke about is the fact that there are no internationally agreed upon peacetime norms in cyberspace that maintain and that, that, that keep a tamp on an arms race, if you will, in terms of rising numbers of actors, rising numbers of capabilities. There is no significant deterrent to malicious activity in cyberspace. Um, the other thing is uh, I would mention is that the, some of the nation state proxies that target uh, the Department of Defense or our Five Eyes allies um, or our other partners are the same actors that are also targeting Sony. Uh, they're targeting uh, the Democratic National Committee. They're targeting Anthem and OPM and the Joint Staff and the White House and the Senate and the State Department. And so they are also they're act active in .com as well as .mil. There's an advantage to that. Um, and that advantage is the partnership that we have with industry. There are some very, very good cyber defense firms, uh, many represented in this audience. And the information that you collect and that you share with us on those advanced threat actors in those systems out in, the, out in industry that have been attacked, they add to the adversary playbooks that we build and we get a better understanding of how these actors operate in cyberspace. So I will just leave it for there with context, and then we'll follow up with some questions. OK, okay. Nora. Uh, I just want to say thank you again to, to Pete Daly and to the Naval Institute gang and FCA for putting this on again. It is a tremendous venue for us to talk about any number of things but the challenges that face us all these days, and, and I want to thank Jamie for moderating and my fellow panel members. From my perspective as the third fleet commander, uh, are we ready to fight any day? And I'll, I'll go back to what, what Mike, uh, Joey, and Jamie just said. There's a lot of challenges out there today. Nobody's going to argue that. My job at Third Fleet is, well, one of, one of our jobs at Third Fleet is to ensure that the forces that are deploying from the West Coast are as ready as they can be for whatever challenge they may face. And whether it's in Sixth Fleet and some of the, the challenges, the phase two challenges that Jamie talked about, whether it is what Joey's seeing out in Seventh Fleet, Sean's folks down in Fourth Fleet, and I will say along with that, Fred's team working uh, with us on the drug problem or us working with them, however you want to look at it, um, I would say we are ready. And the reason that I say that is because the communication flow, I think, is as good as I've seen it in my career between the forward operating forces, primarily for us, 7th Fleet and 5th Fleet, but again, as, as we deploy forces from the West Coast, from the East Coast, you don't know where they're going to end up. And so we prepare folks for whatever contingency they may face globally. So CSG-15 is the training and certification strike group on the West Coast. Their sister strike group, CSG-4, on the East Coast. Third Fleet is responsible for ultimately certifying the forces that go forward. But CSG-15 and CSG-4 work very closely with the Seventh Fleet Commander, the Fifth Fleet Commander, the Sixth Fleet Commander, who understand the requirements from the COCOMs, and we train and certify those forces going forward to the requirements of the COCOMs and the Forward Fleet Commanders every day. Additionally, 
Um, we are working with the TICOMs, and I think some of my TICOM brethren are out there in the audience today, but ensuring that those platforms, be they ships, be they aircraft, be they EOD forces, whatever the case may be, submarines, that those platforms and those individuals who operate those platforms are prepared as they can be when they are handed over to CSG-15 and Third Fleet for the integrated phase of training. And because of the coordination and the synergy, I think that we have today among the TICOMs, the CISCOMs, the, the forward commanders, I think that we are preparing those forces as well as we possibly can to meet the challenges that they may face from a phase zero to a phase two scenario anywhere in the world. We recently deployed uh, Carl Vinson strike group and we did something new with the Carl Vinson strike group. After she was trained and certified in the, the phases, the basic phase, the integrated phase of training, we did something, and, and Admiral Shoemaker mentioned it this morning, uh, called the fight to Hawaii. And what we did was, post-certification of that strike group, we gave them some extra uh, instruction, if you will, uh, some extra training as they transited to Hawaii. And they did, the Air Wing did more flying, they operated MCON, we then put them through the undersea warfare exercise once they got out there. So once they got in theater and they uh, entered the South China Sea on Friday, that they were as prepared as they possibly could be. And Joey talked a little bit about the exercises in Seventh Fleet. It doesn't stop with the certification. Continually, while these forces are out there on deployment, they are sharpening the spear with our partners and allies and working to ensure that every day they're as ready as they can be to face those contingencies. Additionally, for Third Fleet, we have a defense support of civil authorities. Uh, mission and a maritime homeland defense mission that we are responsible for with our Coast Guard friends, with our Canadian friends, and with the joint forces. And so we, are con we have forces every day that are assigned as our maritime homeland defense forces, and we continually do exercises under NORTHCOM and U.S. Fleet Forces, who is the naval component under NORTHCOM, to ensure that we're as ready as we can be in the event of a natural disaster for the defense support of civil authorities, and if, if the case may be that we have to provide maritime homeland defense. So I, I, I feel very confident that we are as ready as we possibly can be for any contingency globally. We'll talk about, we have talked about the challenges that we face. Do we have enough ships? Do we have enough aircraft? Is readiness where it needs to be? We can always, always use more ships, more aircraft. Um, we talked this morning about the maintenance and the modernization piece. We're all working together to ensure that we are getting our forces through that maintenance and modernization. So again, the sailors have the most ready platforms for them to go out there and fight if they have to. And I'll stand by for any questions. Over to you, Sean. Thanks, Admiral Tyson. Admiral Daly with the Naval Institute and, and uh, General Wood with FCA. Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to, to join us coming from the East Coast. Admiral Fogo, thanks for including me to sit on this panel with my fellow numbered fleet commanders. It's an honor to be here and represent my fourth fleet team. I'll provide a little upfront context I'm a numbered fleet commander in the United States Navy who has no permanently assigned or allocated forces. So I bring a little bit different perspective to answer that question as to are we ready to fight? Are we ready to fight tonight? And I can unargu unarguably say yes we are because I, I have a different perspective. 
Uh, one, I've got uh, many ships that are strategically dispersed in the Mayport, Florida basin. They're under the uh, command and control of uh, flag officers and organizations up in Norfolk, and I watch them pull in and out of the basin each day as they prepare to go support overseas deployments to other combatant commands. And I watch them go through all their certifications, all their training and workups, and they're doing very, very well. I also have a perspective when forces chop to the 4th Fleet AOR, I take operational control of them. They then do belong to me, and they operate in the SOUTHCOM AOR. And I can tell you across all three of my lines of operation, they do very, very well. Be it maritime security operations, the, the detection and monitoring of the, the counter-illicit trade fight, the counter-narcotics fight, um, in security, se uh, security cooperation activities, where we participate in exercises and have many different engagements with our partner nations to build partnership capacity, and also in response to crisis or contingency. Uh, probably one of the most predominant threats in my AOR is Mother Nature, uh, with earthquakes, hurricanes, unexpected weather phenomena that can decimate some of the poor countries down there. U.S. Naval forces prove over and over again that they're ready across the entire spectrum of, of war fighting to respond. They do it very, very well. Um, the nature of our threat in the SOUTHCOM AOR is somewhat traditional, but also has, uh, has exposed a, a new threat to us. Uh, we, we do suffer from the malign influence of Russia, China, and Iran as, as those countries try to come in and, and break down institutions and governance and break down the social and economic fiber of our southern partners. Um, we have the influence, as I mentioned a moment ago, of Mother Nature. She's a big, bold threat in our AOR. And, and now we're looking completely in a, in, a, in a more innovative way. Instead of looking at the tradi those traditional threats, we're looking at how they're all networked. And Admiral Tidd has all of us in the SOUTHCOM team embarking on a new strategy to go after the nodes of the key networks, to understand how the networks are connected and interrelated, how they operate, uh, as opposed to trying to chase a single commodity strategy that has defined our AOR for decades, that of counter-narcotics. I'll leave it at that now. I look forward to taking your questions. Sir? Hey, thanks. Uh, thanks very much to the Naval Institute for inviting the Coast Guard up here. It's, it's great to be up here in a sea of khaki. I, there's one other coast in the audience here, and I already told him if you have any tough questions, I'm handing them off to him. Uh, but I get a chance to work with these other folks uh, pretty regularly, more often than you would think. And so if you asked me if the Coast Guard was ready to fight tonight, I would tell you, yeah, they are ready to fight tonight. And in fact, they're ready to fight today. And in fact, they are fighting today and tonight and last night in traditional Coast Guard missions uh, with the drug war that you hear so much about down in the Western Hemisphere. It takes a, a, a lot of effort. It connects us to naval intelligence, and, and it's a traditional mission that you would expect the Coast Guard to have, which would be interdiction, interdiction and picket, things that we would augment the Navy, that we do well. And that's, that's very much an issue of figuring out where the targets are, understanding MDA, sorting them out, figuring out who you're going to look at, picking the one, and then sending a boarding party over and doing boarding and visit kind of things. So. Many of the things Admiral Alcoin talked about, such as illegal unregulated fishing and law enforcement and piracy and humanitarian assistance and disaster reliefs, um, those are traditional kind of Coast Guard missions as well. And it gives us a connection into a lot of other AORs, particularly over and throughout the Pacific, and other nations whose navies do a lot of Coast Guard kind of things. So absolutely, I think we're ready to go. And I think it's a good connection to the things that you would expect the Coast Guard, the way we would augment the Navy in times of uh, conflict. The last thing I'd tell you is, are we ready to fight? Yes, we're ready to fight. Can we fight harder? That's where I'd hesitate. And, and the reason I would hesitate is that we're already pushing the ships that we have and the men and women that are on those ships, I think, as hard as we can push them. So we've used up what I consider to be a surge capacity, and we got the pedal all the way down. Cocaine production is absolutely through the roof in the Western Hemisphere. And we've got more that's coming up north, and we have ships to stop it. Um, so I'll hand it over to you now and look forward to your questions. All right, thank you very much. Very distinguished remarks from our panelists. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for getting through that uh, very quickly. Um, I'm interested in going to questions from the audience as soon as possible. 
I've got things that I can keep uh, the panel talking about and going on for the preponderance of our remainder of 45 minutes, but we'd like to hear from you. So I want to open that up to you first and uh, see what curiosities you have for our panelists. And there are mics out there to be distributed. Uh, I have a quick question. Yes, sir. As an icebreaker, um, first, thank you to all the panelists for appearing, taking the time and for your synopsis of your readiness uh, to fight. Recently, each of the service vice chiefs gave some pretty grim testimony about current readiness. And uh, I'd ask you to talk about, you have already kind of touched on the forces that you're providing forward, either as a provider or the person who's the receiving team but it seems that a lot of it, a lot of the limitations that were cited by the vice chiefs, including Eva Moran, had to do with bench strength and what's behind it. And uh, I, I just asked the panel to comment on that. Any takers? Hey, uh, just uh, from Ford deployed, as I said earlier, that uh, we don't see some of that uh, because uh, we're pretty well resourced. Uh, but you know, uh, with the vice chief uh, speaking in front of the um, Congress there, you know, where we were in 9-11, uh, we had a lot more ships and 400,000 people, and we've come down significantly. And uh, the pace we're at, you know, FDNF, uh, we are, um, there are a lot more um, requirements out there than we have uh, resources, and so uh, we're having to cut back um, and make sure we're maintaining the uh, maintenance and training uh, out there in uh, for deployed Navy. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in real quick. Um, Jamie mentioned that in my previous job, I was the deputy at Fleet Forces, and prior to that, I was the vice director of the joint staff. And in the, in, so since 2012, when I first got to the joint staff, I've I'd been on the on the sidelines or in the middle of readiness generation. One of the things that we talked about specifically during Admiral Greenert's tenure as CNO was appetite. I think somebody mentioned it at the um, at the panel this morning is appetite suppression. So if, if you're a combatant commander, your job is to successfully, at, at the high end if required, to fight and win. In order to do that, if you're a, a smart guy or gal, you're going to want all the resources that you can get. So I would venture to say that if Admiral Harris could get his hands on five aircraft carriers and if uh, the CENTCOM commander and the UCOM commander likewise, and of course my buddy Sean Buck here who is asking for rowboats, <laughs> he's asking for anything we can give him down in SOUTHCOM. So do we feel comfortable that the forces that we are sending forward are ready? Yes. Um, do, do we think that we could actively employ more forces? Absolutely, every day, everywhere in the world, because that's what we do. It's about presence, we've talked about sea control, so, but those forces that we put forward, we want to ensure that they are as ready, as prepared, as modernized, cruise trained as they can be. So in order to do that, we've got to take the time, the effort, the money to put those ships through those maintenance modernization periods. Likewise, I know she's here somewhere, um, the aircraft that we fly around the world, whether it's off of aircraft carriers or land-based, they require a certain amount of maintenance too. We've talked about the F-18s and the fact that we are flying them much longer than we ever anticipated. And that takes maintenance and modernization in order for us to do that. So um, I don't know if that answered your question, Admiral Daly, but um, 
I, I think that it's it's all in the the perspective that you're looking at readiness. Could could we have more forces and therefore be more ready? I think probably so, but I think we all feel very comfortable with what we have and its preparedness. Well, I was really, thank you. I was really trying to get it. I know that you guys are not the type commanders and you are not doing the man training equip. You're the numbered fleet commanders, but you hit on an important point, which is the numbers. And uh, just five years ago, we could put uh, three, carriers out there, either deployed or ready to go in 30 days, and a couple more to reach in 90 days. And today, we're just emerging from a, a two-month gap that we had where there was nothing except the Reagan forward deployed in Japan. There was not one other deployed carrier. So it seems that we're at about half the capacity of what's behind what's out there today to provide surge and backup and in the regard that we're trying to meet operational plans and the scenarios that you have to win, that you have to use to fight and win, um, to me what's concerning is that you can be okay at one pace, but when you go to the high end, if required, if credible combat power is required, um, that's where it seems to be a lot more Fragile. I can talk Thank you, Pete. This. Sure, Go I'll ahead. talk about the cyber force for a second. If I had the uh, the option, I would uh, set three benchmarks uh, for the cyber force, and they're essentially the same benchmarks that JSOC sets for the services. That those operators be handpicked, that they be exquisitely trained, and that they be well resourced. And I'm not sure that we meet, uh, we meet the mark uh, across those three areas as best we should in the domain that I described in my opening statement. Where we uh, see gaps in the cyber side, we have a phenomenal force. And just to give you a snapshot, uh, across the joint forces, 133 cyber teams. Those are split just about evenly between the offense and the defense. The Navy has 40 teams, 20 offensive and 20 defensive. Now, the offensive teams, we present to uh, the force commander, the joint commander, which is Admiral Rogers at U.S. Cyber Command. We retain six cyber protection teams. Um, but all of those teams, uh, they, need, they need to either be on mission or they need to be in a simulator every single day. And so the only parallel that I can draw is to uh, ASW operators and the fact that those skills atrophy very, very quickly. And it's the same thing in cyber particularly with the high-end threat that continues to involve in terms of lethality and stealthiness. And so we need to put more money into, the, into, the, into a persistent training environment that allows these operators to be training every day if they're not actually on mission. Because the mission requires that we, we do not operate on a cyclic cycle, and so it's 24-7, 365 in, in this particular uh, at, at 10th Fleet. Um, Separately, uh, besides the training piece, it's the capabilities piece. And so I, I described a threat actor that is able to get his hands on new tools uh, literally by the hour. I need better tools than, that, uh, than, than the adversary has. And so I want the best developers uh, available, and I want to attract them to the United States Navy so that we can bring a punch to the fight. Um, and the, the last thing, uh, I guess, uh, that I'd say we, we, probably, uh, we, uh, we probably need is a, is a way to retain uh, people in an environment where, you know, uh, for the folks in industry who are sitting out there uh, in, in, in cyber defense, you're poaching from each other every single day. Uh, and so I am not in an advantage in that particular, you know, in that particular fight to retain people. The best thing I can do is to keep them on mission and give them, give them the toughest problems possible, and that's what we try to do. Thanks, Mike. Uh, let's go to our second question at the mic, please. Hi. Um, I work for a small defense contractor. I'm an exploit developer, and my question's for Admiral Gilday. Um, what avenues currently exist to allow small business to uh, sell weaponized exploits to the Navy? Uh, and so, principally, we need to get you through DIUX in order to uh, in order to field those capabilities rapidly. 
Uh, and we're also going to want to have the ability to uh, tinker with whatever you bring to the table because me, we may want to customize it. And so there are agreements that have to be, you know, have to be forged, but I think the right answer is DIUX out in Silicon Valley or Austin or Boston because the acquisition cycle that we have that typically br that fields equipment or uh, fields anything uh, it takes a couple of years is not going to do it. It doesn't do it for us. Quick follow-up. Yeah. Uh, so I'm familiar with DIUX uh, just yep. a little bit. They seem to be more where they publish um, RFPs and they don't answer unannounced white papers that are submitted. Does that correlate to what you know? No, not at all. And so uh, I actually have a Navy Reserve element up at DIUX uh, selfishly to look out for our interest. And uh, if, if you talk to me later, we can put you in contact with those folks. Thanks. Yep. All right, Sydney, it's always bad when you walk to the podium with your laptop open, ready to, <laughs> to talk about something. So go ahead. The floor right. is yours. Uh, Sydney Friedberg, Breaking Defense. A question uh, really across the board, uh, since we actually have lots of operational commanders uh, in uh, geographic fleets, and then we have 10th Fleet. With cyber being, on the one hand, in everybody's everything all the time, and yet also being this in a globally interconnected thing that doesn't respect traditional theater boundaries, how do you work together? It's something that's you know, crucially involved in every single fleet's operations on every platform uh, and potentially in your pocket. Uh, and yet also there's this global element that you know, is necessarily centralized at Fort Meade. Uh, and it seems you know, very hard, at least in my uh, layperson's mind, to, re to reconcile uh, those two things. How do you do it day to day? So how about if I lead off and then you guys can pile on? Because it's not, it's not going to be a perfect answer. Um, and so uh, the first thing I would say, uh, the first thing I would say is that we execute through our task force structure, which is essentially in 10th Fleet. It is functionally oriented, functionally focused, regionally aligned, globally connected. And so uh, I, have, uh, I have commands that are focused solely on the Pacific, right, that are focused on cyber actors, that are focused on intelligence collection, signals intelligence collection, that are focused on providing Admiral Alcoin communications, and they are regionally focused. Same thing in Fourth Fleet, same thing in Fifth Fleet, same thing in Sixth Fleet. And so that connection is through those task forces. I think part of the problem that we have is that, uh, and this goes right to Admiral Davidson's argument on fleet centricity, is that if we'd like fleet commanders to dominate, to basically own the battle space and to fight the fight in the battle space that they, that they own, then you really have to resource, resource their staffs to do that. And so there's a convergence here of communications, cyber, EW, and SIGINT that looks like a Venn diagram, right? But, and so they all come together in a fight in a very fast moving fight. But I don't think that we have given that kind of expertise with a deep bench to fleet commanders organized in that fashion so that they can fight in this domain very, very quickly. And so I think that, you know, what they're gonna say is they are grasping for information about, you know, how are they at risk? You know, uh, can, can 10th Fleet do more to assure me that my critical key cyber terrain uh, is protected, uh, and so they don't they they don't see enough of 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 me. I'm operating through my task forces, but it's probably at this point, given given the scope and scale of the threat, uh, inadequate. You want to go? Go ahead. The uh, I don't know. It's a good question, and uh, uh, you know, like other uh, uh, mission areas, it is not as mature. We understand that. Uh, but it uh, really impacts all of us, and so uh, we're uh, uh, we want more um, and uh, uh, understand uh, that we're not there. Uh, that uh, we've been working on anti-submarine warfare and you know others uh, for quite some time. Uh, the cyber realm, uh, I think we all understand how uh, much it impacts us. Uh, but we need to work together. There are some areas uh, that we are going very well in INW that really give us good situational awareness in our AOR. Uh, and we want that to continue. Uh, but uh, we got a long ways to go in, in the cyber realm. Nora. 
Yeah, I'll just add that th this is another one of those mission sets that requires an incredible amount of coordination, collaboration, synergy. There's a hardware piece to this, and that is, Pat Piercy talked about it this morning, what the surface warfare community is doing as far as the, the cyber task force and the training at the basic level. So there's a hardware piece that involves spay war. It involves, I'm looking at Boris Becker and, and Matt Kohler sitting here together. Um, it, it's, do we have the hardening of our, of our platforms? Have we trained the operators appropriately so that they can operate that hardware and then from an operational synergy with Mike and his teams out there, we've got to make sure that all the dots are connected through that basic phase of training with our warfighting development centers. Matt and the information uh, warfare community is just becoming IOC with their warfighting development center that is very synergistic with the other communities to ensure that we are developing across those communities the TTPs that we need to ensure that, that, that we are as, as hardened and secure as we can be in the cyber realm. And this morning there was a little bit of discussion about the, and I'm talking pretty specifically the defensive side. I will defer to Mike if you want to talk the offensive side. But again, that's one of those things that it takes all of us on the, the TICOM level, the SISCOM level, the operators to ensure that all those dots are connected because as Mike knows better than anybody, it is a fast moving target, both offensively and defensively, and we've got to do everything that we can with the industry, with our joint partners, with our allies, to make sure that, that we are as hardened and as prepared as we can be. In an AOR where I don't have an imminent high-end threat, I can be much more deliberate in how we operate and protect the soft underbelly uh, of our country. I'm advantaged and enabled quite well by the task force organization that Admiral Gilday has described. Um, indications and warning are very, very good for me. I, I'm a numbered fleet commander that has to be more predictive, uh, more deliberate, and ask for resources to get after my mission sets. And with the great I and W that I get on the offensive nature from, from my task force assigned to the fourth fleet, I'm able to do that. Uh, and then I echo all the comments on the defensive nature of all of us uh, across our force, be it whatever community uh, that, that we have in the Navy. Thanks. Fred, what about the Coast Guard? Yep, there actually is a Coast Guard Cyber Commander. His previous assignment, it's a flag officer, his previous assignment was a 7 at U.S. Cyber Command. So he's connected into the joint world. And he's got a couple of bosses. He's a direct report up to U.S. Cyber Command. Also has got a direct report into the Commandant. Um, and so... Our lines of effort, where well, there's a Coast Guard cyber strategy, it's got really three lines of effort that says be able to defend and operate your own system internally, uh, be able to exploit your adversary's uh, cyber um, capability, and protect the maritime transportation system. So we've developed just recently here within the last uh, six months the support-supported relationship between the Coast Guard cyber commander and the two area commanders in those three areas. So. Obviously a lot of work to be fleshed out there, but as far as the who's, who's in charge when, we've, we've nailed down the pieces about, about how we would respond. Thank you. Young lady. Hi, good afternoon. Megan Eckstein with U.S. Naval Institute News. Um, I have one and a half questions for the panel. Uh, first, Admiral Harris said during lunchtime uh, that he was looking for more innovation. I believe he said innovation or die. So I was wondering, based on the specific challenges you face in each of your fleets, uh, where you would like to see the most innovation? And then for my half question, Admiral Alcoin, I'm very curious to hear the second half of your answer to the question that Admiral <laughs> Fogo didn't go. ask. <laughs> okay, fair enough. So uh, innovation. Uh, 
You know, I'll throw out a couple of uh, thoughts on innovation. Uh, it's a term that is uh, probably overused. Um, it's a, a term that has become quite prevalent in the 21st century as uh, we move ahead in leaps and bounds according to Moore's Law and the advent of new uh, systems that uh, communicate uh, through these technologies you all have sitting in your laps now. iPhones keep getting better and more powerful. And uh, it's, uh, it's, we're at the point where, geez, how can we better, how can we innovate when, is there anything else to innovate for or on? And so one of the things we did out in uh, Sixth Fleet AORs was let's start, let's stop thinking about the technology, let's think about how we fight and be more innovative in how we fought. Uh, you talked, somebody asked a question, Pete Daly asked a question earlier about uh, um, readiness and modernization in the Vice Chief's testimony. Uh, you know, one of the things that should have been intuitively obvious to us and perhaps is innovative or maybe it's just uh, the epiphany the light bulb went on in how we fight is we had these carrier strike groups in the Mediterranean operating all the time and the CNO was much, much more generous with presence in that theater. Uh, when I was over there for two years, I saw more submarines, more carriers, more amphibious readiness groups to help augment those four forward deployed naval forces, those destroyers that were in Rota. And when people ask you, is that enough? Do you have enough fleet commander? Um, you know, er, any fleet commander worth his or her salt would say, no, I want more. But we also have to be uh, uh, good um, uh, custodians of the national treasury. So in a phase zero environment, it's adequate. What you're given to, to operate with in your theater is adequate. And that goes through a process in the joint staff that's very elaborate, the global force um, management allocation process of forces. However, it changes when you go from phase zero to phase one or phase two. And Avril Davidson struck on this the last time we got together as three stars and four stars. Said, How many of you guys and gals out there are operating in a phase two environment now? You know Admiral Donegan is, probably one of the reasons why he's not here. Admiral Grady is, probably one of the reasons why he's not here. There are strikes going on throughout their theaters. So how can we better innovate and use some of those assets that are out there? You saw it last summer when the Harry S. Truman uh, both went through the Sixth Fleet and into the Fifth Fleet and then came back out again. Pete alluded to the carrier gap. She continued to do strikes while she was in the Mediterranean. And that worked, and there were some healthy skeptics there. It took a little bit of innovation, a little creativity, a lot of hard work and some push-ups. When the Eisenhower came through, we did the same thing. You know, again, this is... Uh, uh, distributed maritime ops across unified command plan lines, uh, seamless integration, and two combatant commanders in one theater supporting one and another with an effective strike capability that really made no difference. It's about the same distance, about the same number of tankers in the air, and about the same number of uh, kinetic weapons delivered during Operation Inherent Resolve. So we're doing a little bit of innovation in war fighting. War College helps us out with some of the training that we get there, uh, some of the schools that we go to, and those young lieutenants, commanders, and captains that are on the pointy end of the spear are using their noggins, uh, which is what we pay them to do, to help us get better bang for the buck. That's my answer. I know that you'll have other people over here that will tell you something different. So, Be, uh, Before Admiral Alcoin answers your half question, I just do a quick, uh, quick paid political uh, announcement or advertisement for Southcom to all of you all. Uh, we like to present ourselves to each and every one of you as the U.S. Navy's uh, laboratory of choice for RDT&E, for any maritime systems or TTPs. Try, try it in Southcom first. We offer great water. We offer great airspace, warning areas. We're close to home, so you can come down, do your test, and get back to your parent command and analyze all the data from your tests. And uh, we're not doing it for us. We're generally not going to be able to take the capability and capacity that you innovate and that you test with and turn into programs of record. But what we do is we can do that and pass it off to our warfighting fleet commanders in the 5th, 6th, and 7th fleet who need it a lot more than I do down in the 4th fleet. I, and I would say to answer your question, Megan, for, from my perspective, where we need to leverage innovation the most is in preparing these forces to go fight at the highest end they may re be required to. 
So a lot of work has been done in the live, virtual, constructive training world, if you will. And because we don't have as many ships, aircraft, submarines at our disposal that we would like to have to prepare these forces for the highest level of war fighting that they may find themselves in, we have really, really got to leverage that live virtual constructive training to make sure that we are using it to the best of our ability because we don't have 100 op force ships while a strike group is out there doing workups. We don't have supersonic missiles that we're shooting at them. We don't have, you know, three or four spare air wings sitting around that we can use as op for to prepare these forces to go forward. So I would answer your question that way, that we have really got to make sure that we are being very innovative in using all the, the technology that's out there, both on uh, the basic phase and the integrated phase so that we can get to that high-end training and preparation of those forces. Thanks. Mike? Yeah, real quick. Uh, so for me, the key word uh, is creativity. Uh, and so for us, uh, the best work that comes out of uh, our command in terms of new ideas, in terms of how to fight, come from our, come from our cyber teams, come from the basic level, uh, people in their early 20s, who are just simply given the, given the charge, give me options that make me gag. And so whether or not we actually execute those or a whole different ball game, we put money against some of them. We experiment with ships, aircraft, uh, UAVs, um, submarines. Uh, and so uh, unique to the maritime, unique to maritime forces is the, the thought of access. And in cyber, in order to do anything, you need access. And so ships, aircraft, submarines can get to places where ground forces cannot go sometimes or air forces cannot go. And so, um, so we, we do a lot of creative thinking on how, on how to fight. On the innovation piece, um, for me, uh, we really are trying to leverage things that uh, are coming out of industry. And I say that because the things that are being developed to solve problems in companies that have legacy networks just like we do, they're the same solution sets. They're just applied in a different network. And so those solutions are coming from outside the lifelines largely, and so it's up to us to find those right solution sets, to find those right technical solutions, uh, and the ones that, that, that are attractive to us are the ones that we can, of course, scale globally. Thank you. And Megan, I haven't forgotten about your second question. I just want to say first, uh, Megan is a strategic communicator for the U.S. Naval Institute. She is a force multiplier for the U.S. Naval Institute. Notice I say the Institute, not the Navy. Uh, the news that she relays and promotes is honest and fair. She can't be bought, but I read these things. I read these things when we're overseas. I read them in the Pentagon, so does everybody else. You keep the lines of communication open, and you keep that uh, strategic stuff out there where everybody in the audience and all the folks up here on stage can appreciate it, and we're all on the same sheet of music when we open up our U.S. Naval Institute news or our... Uh, uh, chin folk clips every day and you're in there all the time so thanks for what you do it's terrific for such a uh, uh, credible and capable young person and now for your second part of your question so uh, these <laughs> folks are all stand-up folks up here I don't I don't need to feed them questions but you know we had themes so I said okay for Joey you know everybody's gonna want to talk about China and he treated that one pretty well uh, the other theme the second question that he didn't get to is Korea and if you look across uh, the last week or two General Mattis went out to Korea to reassure allies. He went other places, too, to Japan, um, you know, some of our strongest uh, alliances. Um, we had uh, the Munich Security Conference talk about European security, but, you know, Admiral Stavridis alluded to things that are going out in the Pacific that are important today. Kim Jong-un launched another missile, and frankly, it was pretty impressive. It was, uh, you know, a, a, like a submarine missile launched from a tank. Uh, solid fuel and uh, pretty impressive. Uh, is he a rational, cold, calculating actor? Is he irrational? And Joey's got a tough job because he has to support, you know, the combatant commander out there, Admiral Harris, as well as General Brooks. Brooks, and I don't know if you saw General Brooks was on 60 Minutes on Sunday, 
right up at the DMZ talking about how hard that fight would be. So for the guy who has, uh, and really two, Third Fleet and Seventh Fleet, who have the preponderance of naval forces out there, how, are you, how do you hedge and how are you ready to fight against something like a North Korean aggression or Kim Jong-un? Yeah, Megan, to answer that first part, are we ready to fight? It's uh, really the um, inherent tension between the, the demand signal for operations and the necessity for maintenance and training. And it's tough because our allies want our submarines, they want our airplanes, they want our ships, they want our people out there operating, operating with them. And uh, so we have, there's a balance there. You know, how do you balance the operations, the exercises, the maintenance and training? And that's something we have to do every day. And we got pretty good uh, metrics when it comes to aviation and we're getting better in the other uh, communities. Uh, but that requires uh, a lot of work and it's probably one of the most important tasks we have out there is uh, uh, maintaining our readiness. As far as uh, North Korea, you heard Admiral Harris uh, talk to them. Uh, talk about uh, them today and um, you know if there's a fight tonight uh, that it's, it's probably going to happen on the Korean Peninsula. We support General Brooks uh, you know and the first thing we say is we hope uh, that North Korea abides by the uh, United Nations uh, Security Council resolution to stop development of nuclear weapons but I'm not holding my breath on that regard and so what we really uh, rely on it's a three-pronged approach uh, that uh, technology uh, you know our partnerships and training and the technology, really, uh, Seven Fleet is, uh, you know, with the shift to the Pacific, we get the best equipment. You know, we've got uh, E2Ds out there in Iwakuni now. We've got the F-35Bs uh, with 3MEF. Uh, we got an all-super Hornet Air Wing. Um, and, we're, and in a couple of years, we'll have F-35Cs out there. Uh, we got Virginia-class submarines uh, making lots of deployments in the uh, Western Pacific. Uh, and uh, we also uh, have high-end uh, upgraded uh, BMD shooters in our uh, DDGs. And so, um, you know, that combined with the Tippy 2s that we have in Japan, uh, the Patriot batteries, uh, it provides a pretty good umbrella um, as far as uh, ballistic missile defense. As far as partnerships, uh, we're in our 64th year uh, with the South Koreans and the mutual uh, treaty uh, that uh, uh, in our alliance that is a foundation uh, for the uh, peace and stability uh, in, the, in the peninsula and in the region, uh, in, in Northeast Asia. They do help out uh, quite a bit. And we do a lot of exercises uh, with them. We have two major exercises under General Brooks, Key, Re Key Resolve and Ultra Freedom Guardian, uh, that we uh, show the North that we're ready uh, to um, deter any aggression. Uh, and uh, uh, that's and so the, those those exercises and those partnerships, uh, I think on a daily basis we show the North uh, that we're ready to effectively uh, stop them uh, if the need arises. Nor anything to add on the Koreans. Do I have anything to yeah. add on the Koreans? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, if if. If you're going from, toward, from the perspective of Third Fleet, I know you've okay. been operating more forward. All right, so, yeah. so Third Fleet forward, uh, Admiral Swift, who took command of the Pacific Fleet two months before uh, I took command of the Third Fleet, said, hey, here's, here's what I want you to do. I, I want to blur this dividing line, the international date line between Third Fleet and Seventh Fleet and I want Third Fleet to be able to complement Seventh Fleet, provide me, Admiral Swift, more flexibility uh, with the forces that I have available to me in the Pacific AOR, being Third and Seventh Fleet. So uh, what we have done in the past, really, 18 months is we have worked, we Third Fleet have worked very closely with Seventh Fleet and Pack Fleet in developing our Third Fleet's capability to command and control forces forward in the Western Pacific with the assumption that if something were to happen, and as Joey said, the number one probability of a fight tonight scenario would be on the Korean Peninsula, would be in the, the KTO, the Korean Theater of Operations, if that were the case, the assumption is 
that Joey and his team would be pretty busy up there uh, working for General Brooks in managing that problem, and Third Fleet would be available to provide that command element to handle whatever else may happen in the Pacific Fleet AOR, be it a, another Ache, I'm looking at Admiral Crowder right now, who is very familiar with that scenario, um, be it a major humanitarian disaster requiring that level, a JTF three-star commander, be it some scenario, a maritime security issue in the South China Sea. So we have been working very closely with Seventh Fleet, with Joey and his team, and PAC Fleet to ensure that we have the connective tissue that if something were to happen, that Third Fleet could very quickly respond, complement Joey and his team, and handle whatever scenario may come to pass in the, in the Pacific Theater. Thanks, Nora. Vice Admiral Jay Donnelly had a question. This is for uh, Admiral Alcoin. Um, there have been some media reports recently that China, I think attributed to uh, Chinese CNO Wu Shengli, has indicated a desire to uh, institute a policy that any submarines in their territorial waters, to be defined what that means, would have to be on the surface flying their national ensign. And I just wondered what Seventh Fleet's readiness today would be if that policy uh, came out from China. Uh, the, uh, you know, we're going to, uh, uh, standard response is we're going to fly, sail, operate wherever international law allows and um, uh, conduct our submarine operations just like we've been doing. You know, the same could be said for the ADAs uh, that uh, proposed in the, in the South China Sea, uh, that we're going to uh, continue to fly our aircraft like we've always been doing and maintaining the peace stability in this region like uh, we've been doing for 70 years and the, and the whole area has prospered as a result, um, but uh, not uh, to uh, change uh, uh, as a result of uh, what was said the other day. Sir. Uh, Bruce Rennie, Naval Submarine League, question for 7th Fleet. <clears throat> a couple years ago when Freedom completed her first deployment to Singapore, uh, there were some stories that came out of unattributed sources at uh, Seventh Fleet that they didn't see a role for that platform in the Seventh Fleet. As, have we figured out what to do with LCS? And could you comment on what you think the strength and weaknesses of that platform? Yeah, I, I, uh, I can uh, tell you that uh, we want LCS, LCS out there as soon as possible. Freedom came out and operated for a year, did unbelievably well. Uh, nine to ten exercises, went over to... Um, India uh, participated in Malabar uh, and is the right size ship uh, you know, with a very uh, low draft there and, um, and smaller size, smaller crew that really works well with a lot of those countries in Southeast Asia and was very happy. She had an issue uh, uh, after that year and we brought her home. We've got the Coronado out there right now, just went into Brunei and, and is sailing back to Singapore, uh, doing very well. The crew is doing a nice job. They're flying the Hilo. Uh, and I cannot wait until we get more LCS uh, there in Singapore and also uh, up there in uh, Japan as well. Uh, there definitely is a role uh, for that size ship and the modular uh, capability inherent in that design. Okay, Pete says we have time for one more question. Young Marine officer there, take it away. Uh, Ma'am, sir, Lieutenant Adams, 3rd Intel Battalion over at 3MEF. Uh, my question's for uh, Admiral Alcoon. Um, one of the ways that we've been able to counter Chinese uh, progress into the South China Sea is our relationship with, with the Philippines. And I was wondering, on your level, have you seen a degradation of our relationship or the exercises in scale or scope with the Philippines? And if so, has there been a reconsideration of how we can maintain our relationship with the Philippines through uh, possible counter uh, piracy or counter drug uh, exercises, specifically within like the Sulu archipelago, 
or anywhere else uh, with the Philippines? Sir? A, a great question. And uh, our relationship with 3MEF has never been stronger. You know, we make a great fighting team between 7th Fleet and uh, 3MEF there. Uh, as far as the Philippines, uh, uh, one of our uh, five allies that Admiral Harris mentioned there at the uh, lunch, and uh, there is a lot of uh, reports uh, coming out uh, about questioning our relationship. Uh, we are pressing forward. Uh, we still have a very good uh, uh, relationship uh, with the uh, Philippine uh, Navy. They want us there. We do detachments, uh, uh, P-8 detachments, um, Growler E-18G uh, detachments, uh, our EOD, and uh, our SEALs uh, go there. And so I think we're working through these, in these perturbations that we're seeing now. Uh, that we've been a, a strong ally with them for so long that I think, uh, you know, uh, at the working level, at our level, we're seeing um, uh, things go as, um, you know, as they have been. And uh, hopefully the newspapers will report some of that um, uh, in the uh, weeks and months to come because uh, um, it, that's an alliance that we want to maintain. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you very much. I think that's uh, a limit of our time. And back over to Admiral Pete Daly. Well, thank you, and uh, I'm ready to credit Admiral Tyson with an excellent idea because I think getting this panel together really does work, especially when you consider the direction the Navy's going with respect to operational centricity and uh, some of the other um, distributed warfare concepts that are, uh, you know, being exchanged. Um, it's an excellent panel, and I just want to thank again Admiral Fogo, Admiral Coyne, Admiral Gilday, Admiral Tyson, Admiral Buck, and Admiral Midget for uh, making the time to do this, have this exchange, and uh, travel so far to share with us today. Um, this would not be a uh, Naval Institute FC event if we didn't uh, hand out at least one Naval Institute press book with an FC a bookmark. And on behalf of the Naval Institute and FC, we thank you. We're giving each one of you a copy of Rules of the Game by Andrew Gordon. I think it's an important book because it talks about where the Brits were at Trafalgar and where the Brits were at Jutland and uh, how and why they got there and the lessons learned from that. Of interest, Admiral Richardson, when he was Vice Admiral Richardson and commander of the submarine force, he paid his personal money to bring this book back and bring it in print uh, to, to be available to uh, his junior officers to read. So we thank you again and uh, really appreciate this. Let's give our panel a hand.